Locked On Seahawks. Your daily Seattle Seahawks podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network. Your team every day. Greetings, 12s and Niner fans. It's time for our weekly Crossover Thursday segment, and this is one of my favorites the entire year when the Seahawks and 49ers get together. I'm Corbin Smith from Locked On Seahawks. Joining me for our crossover show, Brian Peacock and Eric Crocker of Locked On 49ers. Guys, how are we doing? I'll start with Brian, and then I'll go over to Eric. I'm not used to having two other hosts for Crossover Thursday. We're tag teaming you over here now in the uh, in the 2021 season. Added my guy Croc to the Locked On 49ers podcast. We're doing well. This is a uh, the 49ers are an interesting team this year. This is going to be fun. And these two teams coming off losses in Week Three, I think going to be hungry in Week Four. And the 49ers Seahawks rivalry is always strong. I heard Joe Staley on local radio recently talking about these games. He's like, man, I hated those games. I hated playing those teams, but I loved it at the same time because it was always the most difficult games on the schedule, and it meant something. It meant something to the players. They felt the the rivalry. So it's not just in the stands. The the players feel it too. So I'm pumped for this week. This is gonna be a lot of fun. I'm pumped to hopefully can we can we change the narrative right now? And we'll get into it a little bit, but 49 fans aren't too happy with Kyle Shanahan. <laughs> they I feel like they turned on Shanny this week. Oh, People talk a little bit fast. more. About like, like they they turned on him real quick, one loss to the Packers by two points, and you're turning on your head coach. Yeah, the interesting dynamic going on with the yeah, They're doing the whole like genius in quotes. I'm like, oh, okay, he's getting real. Dude, he's when getting you start the air quotes, you know, you know you're in trouble. Yeah. Uh, you guys are doing a perfect segue right now to what we're gonna do here in the first quarter, just kind of the state of these two teams, because uh, I believe for the 49ers that this is you guys' NFC West debut as well. I think it's the opener for both teams. Mm-hmm. So looking at the state of the teams, obviously the 49ers, you guys mentioned, are 2-1. and one. They are coming off that tough loss to the Packers. I'll switch it over here to Brian. You know, what's the vibe around this football team right now? Clearly having a winning record, but the way this division set up, you're in third place at 2-1. and one. It's crazy. Yeah. And like uh, when you look at these teams and and you, somebody's going to be three and or somebody's going to be four and oh after this week. And you don't want to be the team that's two games behind. You definitely don't want that's three games behind, right? Uh, if you're the Seahawks, a one and three with a four and oh team at the top of the division, that's tough to come back from. So I think. Uh, especially the Seahawks, but the 49ers probably feel like their backs against the wall a little bit and they have something to prove coming off. And uh, there's just so much question Niners and what's going on with the quarterback situation and Kyle Shanahan a little bit, um, uh, maybe combative somewhat with the media this week and, and, and saying, yeah, you guys are putting words in my mouth. I never said it was going to be a two quarterback system. I never said it was going to be Trey Lance on the field all the time and, and making it seem like maybe we won't see a lot of Trey Lance this year. And then some fans, are, the, the anti Jimmy fans are really mad. And it's really, there's really a divide that's getting growing by the week that is pro Jimmy and anti Jimmy. And then that becomes anti Kyle. If Kyle does the wrong thing with their favorite quarterback. So, um, and, and it gets amplified during a loss. You win a couple games, everyone's happy and it's fine. It's like, okay, even if your guy's not playing, it's okay. You lose a game and everyone loses their minds. They're like, yeah, I told you this guy's doing this wrong. He's doing this wrong. He's doing that wrong. So uh, it's wild times right now in San Francisco, you know, the team's two and one and in good shape. Two and one and Peacock, Peacock and I, we kind of talked about a little bit after the Philadelphia Eagle game where we weren't necessarily impressed with the 49ers and we thought they came out sluggish and we kind of pointed out areas where we felt like they needed to improve. A lot of our listeners kind of got on us for being too negative after a win. And the game against the Packers started out the same way, but now you're playing against Aaron Rodgers and obviously he made a heroic comeback at the end of that game. But we were actually the ones that kind of defended the 49ers in the sense of saying like, hey, you know, down the stretch, they play well. You're playing against Aaron Rodgers. Like, it's tough to stop him. But the 49er fans are not having any of that. They are ripping the 49ers apart. They are ripping quarterback apart, depending on which side of the fence you're on, whether it's Trey Lance or Jimmy Garoppolo. They're ripping the defensive coordinator apart, even though I thought he called a good game. I, I thought he... The defense did well for the most part outside of like a couple of plays that and Aaron Rodgers and Devontae Smith, and they're just going to kind of get, I mean, Devontae Adams, they're just going to kind of get those type of plays. But 
oh man, the fans are not having it. They are upset. The sky is falling. Now this is not a playoff team. They are not Super Bowl bound. And Kyle Shanahan needs he's on the hot seat. And it's the sky is falling in San Francisco right now, all over and the world. How about this? You, you lose two in a row with the second one being the Seahawks, and then watch how those fans react. I, I don't know if it's like that for you, Corbin. Do you find yourself having to keep fans from getting too high after wins when things are going well and then try to keep them from going too low when things are going maybe not the right direction and and sort of because most times it's kind of in the middle and it's not like we're trying to play the middle on the podcast right but we're just trying to have some journalistic integrity and really break down things the way we see them and after a loss things look usually worse than they really are and sometimes after a win things look better than they really are have you ever heard of seahawks twitter because <laughs> That is a horrific place. <laughs> if you if you just want to take a, a short dive into it, I'm sure you guys have seen a little bit covering the 49ers, but like you guys are talking about the skies falling, oh, just yeah. lost a game. Kyle Shanahan's on the hot seat. Like the Seahawks fans have had pitchforks for Pete Carroll and Ken Norton Jr., the defensive coordinator, and, and the latter, I can kind of understand it because this defense was supposed to be a lot better this year. And you look at the players they have. After extending Jamal Adams, they got Carlos Dunlap back. Daryl Taylor's healthy, and he's actually played pretty well. Really, the issue has been the cornerback spot, which for whatever reason, they just decided, oh, let's go sign Akella Witherspoon. That's a replacement. You guys know how he played in San Francisco and didn't even get out of the end of training camp before they decided, you know what, this didn't work, so we're going to trade him to the Pittsburgh Steelers and eat some of that money that we put on his contract. And so it's just been a disaster on the defensive side of the football, at least the last six quarters, the second half in Tennessee against Tennessee. And then all four quarters, the Minnesota Vikings basically did whatever they wanted. Even without Dalvin cook, we're going to run the ball down your throats. We're going to sling the rock all over the place. We're going to pick on Trey flowers, especially. And Kirk cousins looked like a future hall of famer out there, the way that he was playing against the Seahawks defense. So fans are really upset about, the way that that defense is playing. And to an extent, I can really understand. I don't necessarily get the distaste towards Pete Carroll. I've always been pro Pete Carroll to this point, just because you look at all the wins that he's had, all the playoff teams he had in Seattle, his ability to galvanize the locker room. This is going to be one of the bigger tests that he's had, though, because they just lost two games that they should have won. And really, this has been a year where – a lot of streaks have been broken. He had dominated, Pete Carroll had dominated the Minnesota Vikings. He had never lost to them in Seattle. And we saw that streak end. The Seahawks had never lost a game since their first year in 1976. They had never lost a home game where they led by 15 points or more. That streak ended in week two. So this has been a really weird season. And that's just made things worse for Seahawks Twitter. I mean, it, it's yeah. it's just been an eyesore out there on the interwebs. It's it's wild times in the NFC West, man. And then you got the the, the Rams going all in with their new quarterback. And uh, I never know what to expect from the Cardinals week to week with Cliff Kingsbury, but a dynamic quarterback and, you know, weapons galore on both sides of the ball and some holes as well. Um, but, yeah, it, it's it, this division's crazy. And it's not like the NFC East where you can put, a, put together a good run and probably win the division. Like a good team is not going to be in the playoffs this year. Well, that that could be. West, most likely. Yeah, that, that could be maybe some of the reason why the fans are pressing and wanting more uh, execution early on and maybe more consistency from their team because they know every single game matters. Every win matters because of how loaded the NFC West is. Yeah, that's really the issue for Seahawks fans. They're looking at these last two games. And it's like, it's only week four. We've only played three games. There's so many games left on the schedule, but you had two games there that you were ahead double digits and you lost both of them. Those are going to come back and bite you, even if you were able to turn things around. And the Seahawks have the talent to be able to do that. But uh, certainly discouraging loss. And the fact the offense hasn't been able to do anything in the second half. They've been world beaters in the first half. They truly have been Jekyll and Hyde. So I'm really looking forward to continue diving into where both these teams are at. We're going to talk 49ers coming up next in the second quarter of our show. You're listening to the Lockdown Podcast Crossover Thursday Special, Seahawks and 49ers edition. We'll be right back. 
Hey, Seahawks fans, if you do a lot of driving like I do, then you need to know about a fantastic new app called Get Upside. When you open an account on Get Upside, you can get 25 cents per gallon back every time you fill up at the pump. Over time, that kind of savings really starts to add up. Some people are making as much as two to three hundred dollars per month in cash back with Get Upside, which not only makes it easy to save, but it also gives you multiple cash out options. You can get direct payment to your bank account, PayPal, Amazon gift cards, and much more. And now when you open an account and use the special promo code TOUCHDOWN, you can get a $0.25 cents back per gallon on your first fill-up. That's up to $0.50 cents back per gallon. So don't pay full price of the pump anymore. Download the free GetUpside app. Use our special promo code TOUCHDOWN when you sign up for your account. And start saving every time your car or truck needs a fill-up. That's GetUpside, available in the iTunes App Store and on Google Play. Make sure to use the promo code TOUCHDOWN. Welcome back to Crossover Thursday. I'm Corbin Smith from Locked On Seahawks. We're getting ready for the NFC West opener for both the Seahawks and 49ers. Glad to be joined by Locked On 49ers hosts Brian Peacock and Eric Crocker. Let's talk 49ers. Obviously, this is a team that last year injuries ravaged the entire roster, missed the postseason one year after going to the Super Bowl. They are back mostly healthy. They've had a few injuries early on in the season. Raheem Mostert going at IR out for the rest of the year, but a much healthier roster here in 2021. They're two and one. Brian, let's start with the main topic here at quarterback because the 49ers traded up to get Trey Lance, and a lot of people suspected, okay, Jimmy Garoppolo's on borrowed time. We might see Lance earlier than expected, had a pretty strong start to training camp, did some nice things in the preseason, and yet – here we are now going into the fourth game of the season, and at least from what I've been able to observe, it looks like Jimmy Garoppolo has really responded about as well as you could have asked for him to do with the new quarterback coming in, and he's played pretty solid football these first three games. Yeah, Jimmy's been a pro, and really things things aren't ideal. It's all, you know, Quarterback competitions are always really tough, and, and that's why there's the old saying, when you have two quarterbacks, you really have none, just because of all the other things that go on, and Kyle Shanahan, even at his press conference on Wednesday, just you know getting a little irritated about some questions, because they're, they're not going to stop, and they're going to continue every week, and, and especially after a loss, you're going to continue to get those questions, and Shanahan's talking about how, oh, this isn't the preseason, I'm just going to throw a quarterback in and out of the game, so I think you can kind of throw that Taysom Hill stuff out the window, like that's not what we're going to see with with Trey Lance, he's going to get a couple snaps, maybe a game like we've seen, and maybe some games when there's no snaps. And I thought maybe Kyle Shanahan was lying in the weeds a little bit, and he was going to wait for one of these games, like maybe against the Seahawks would be a good time. And all of a sudden, Trey Lance would come in there and run a whole series or, you know, bomb a bit in the his arms. But I think we'll see a, a similar situation, some short yardage stuff, maybe, um, you know, red zone. We'll see Trey Lance come in for a play or two, but it's, it's Jimmy Garoppolo's show. And I think Kyle Shanahan has made that clear that that's the plan Right now, they're going to roll with Jimmy G. I think one thing early in the season, especially after the first two weeks, winning two games always helps. But seeing how the other first round rookie quarterbacks have performed this year has kind of quieted some fans. And they're like, oh, yeah, it's just not that easy for a rookie quarterback to walk in and dominate in the NFL, even though we've seen some, you know, last year we saw Herbert. and That, that doesn't always happen that way. And it took a while for guys like Josh Allen and even Patrick Mahomes didn't play much his rookie year. So I think some fans kind of saw that and thought, yeah, maybe there's something to it. And we should pump the brakes here on this guy who's played so little football in his life and is so young, 20 years old when he's drafted in Trey Lance. But he's so talented, and he, he brings an aspect to the 49ers team. So they got to use him a little bit, and he needs reps. So he's got to play this year. And I don't know when it's going to be and how much it's going to be, but he has to play. The one thing Kyle Shanahan can't do is let him sit on the bench for another entire season because the thing he's missing on his resume is game reps. So I think we'll see him. I don't know how much we'll see him this week. Over-under is probably two snaps right now every week is where I would put it. And as long as the 49ers win games, it's not going to become a problem. But I could see there being a little bit of sort of some hand wringing if losses start to pile up and you're not, not developing your new quarterback. And uh, losing back-to-back -back games, this is the second game being the Seahawks, might be that catalyst there. Yeah. I, I, think, I think Kyle wants it to happen a little bit more organically and not forced. And right now it seems like the 49ers fans are kind of forcing his hands. We've seen him kind of react this way in the press conference leading up to the draft where he kind of did something to throw everybody off track a little bit and kind of alluded to the fact that he's possibly going to draft uh, Mac Jones and he ended up going with, excuse me, uh, Trey Lance. 
Maybe he's trying to throw people off a little bit right now. Maybe he has plans to utilize Trey Lance and doesn't want to just tell everybody exactly what his plans are. I think that Jimmy Garoppolo, who has his play has kind of been what Jimmy Garoppolo is, right? Been- like there's some there's some good moments where you watch him against the Lions, and then the next two games, there's uh, you know, the, the Eagles game, there was a lot of kind of lower moments and it's outside of like maybe one or two throws. And then you see the Packers game that starts off really weird and he throws his backwards pass that ends up being a fumble and the interception because he's trying to throw the ball down the field. But then he ends up leading the team down the field 75 yards, whatever it was, to score a touchdown to take the lead with 37 seconds left. So we are definitely seeing all shades of Jimmy Garoppolo. Will that be enough to hold off the young rookie quarterback? Again, 49ers 2-1 and one right now, so you don't necessarily have to throw Trey Lance in and have him look like some of these other uh, rookie quarterbacks around the league. And I know 49ers fans, they'll kind of push back on the fact that, well, 49ers have Kyle Shanahan and 49ers have a better team. But right now, that better team and Kyle Shanahan has not looked great against potentially lesser uh, competition on the defensive side of the ball. I want to open the floor up just to skill players in general, because I'm sure both of you will have different players to chime in on. One of my favorite players in the NFL is Debo Samuel. I have always loved the way that he plays the game. He just has that, I'm going to punch you in the mouth mentality. And he is having a breakout year so far. Brian, what have you seen from him? It's just got to be nice having him healthy after being injured most of last year. I mean, health is the number one key for Debo Samuel, and Croc and I have been driving that, and, and we were like, hey, well, hold down. This isn't like, because everyone wanted to crown um, Brandon Ayuk in the offseason and, and say, you know, he's the number one, and Debo's this gadgety guy, and we we're like, no, nah, Debo's a legit receiver, and he can do a lot of things running the football and, and catch and run stuff, but he can get down the field. He can run routes. I really like Debo Samuel, and I actually want to turn the, the floor over to Croc because I know Croc likes Debo Samuel a lot and, and there's a lot there but the guy has to stay healthy and he still has to clear that hurdle but for the first few weeks he has been and you've seen what he can do and he can be a target hog because he's tough he'll go over the middle he'll make catches make plays well debo has been kind of the forgotten guy from the 2019 class and he was the third receiver taken you know and taken ahead of guys like dk metcalf who you guys have and aj brown as well i think now people are starting to really see what he brings to the table and it's a different style of play uh, it's not just this pure route runner, like maybe like a Terry McLaurin or a, a Stefan Diggs or something like that. But he wins in a way of just get the ball in his hands, get the ball in his hands in space. We saw him make several contested catches against the Packers. Um, he's strong after the catch. And now I think the only thing that's kind of missing is a little bit more consistency from the quarterback position to where they feel comfortable pushing the ball downfield a little bit. He, he hasn't seen too many passes downfield, but when he has, he's made the best of them, including that 80-yard touchdown or whatever it was against the Lions. Uh, there was a fourth and two play uh, a couple years ago against the Baltimore Ravens where Jimmy Garoppolo, I don't know if he kind of just panicked, but he just threw the ball up in the air in the area towards Debo, and he came down with it and scored a touchdown. So he is a guy who can win vertically, but the 49ers just don't take shots as much. So we'll see if they start to kind of expand on his role as a downfield receiver. But right now, they're utilizing him underneath. Seems like defense is starting to tighten down a little bit, kind of jump those slants, and is making things a little bit more difficult for Debo Samuel. But so far, he's still found a way to be productive. Speaking of defense, this was maybe the thing that surprised me the most when I started to watch a little bit of film on the 49ers, and I was looking at some stats. And I believe it was pro football reference that I got this from, but – through the first three games, they have 20 quarterback pressures, which is actually near the bottom of the league. And Nick Bosa has pretty good numbers. But, Brian, what is your assessment of their pass rush as a whole right now? Because at least statistically, and it seems like there have been large chunks of games where that front line's kind of disappeared. What have you seen from that group so far? Because the last couple of years, we were expecting that to be the main strength of that defense. And right now, it doesn't look like they're quite on that same level. It, it's really clear it's not going to be the 2019 defense again. But the offense has a chance to be better than it was in 2019 to, to maybe make up for that a little bit and close that gap. Uh, Bosa ruined the Packers' first series of the game. And then after that, he kind of disappeared. And and it's been a huge disappointment up front. The 49ers should have played much better, if not completely dominated, against what the Packers are running out there with the third string left tackle and a rookie center and a rookie guard uh, and they did not win that battle so interior d-line 
Uh, Bosa's had flashes, but he hasn't been his consistently dominant self. I think he's still working back, obviously. He, these are his first three games since tearing his ACL. He didn't play at all hardly in the preseason or or leading up. So he's probably working his way back, and I think Bosa will be fine. He's not going to be um, anything to worry about for the 49ers as long as he stays healthy, and I'm sure he'll be stronger at the end of the year than he is right now at the beginning of the year, and you see those flashes. But it's the rest of the defensive line that needs to really uh, start to carry their weight there and be better versus the run and the pass. And uh, when you see the 49ers who were beat really up front by the Eagles in week two, and then you see what happened to the Eagles against the Cowboys, and you think, well, maybe the 49ers aren't quite as far along as we thought they were going to be right now up front. And that does worry me a little bit because the 49ers are built to win up front because um, they haven't put a ton of resources in the cornerback position, and then they have injuries on top of it. So uh, that's a huge weakness. And if you're not getting after opposing cornerbacks, then you can't give someone like Aaron Rodgers. And we saw what that looks like. And he came back and won the game. And you can't do that with Russell Wilson either. So, and the 49ers have had their own troubles with Russell Wilson, even when they're at full health on the uh, uh, cornerback on in the defensive line. So um, it's the D line, I would say, has been a huge disappointment so far this season for the 49ers. And I want to flip to the secondary with Eric here because. You just mentioned the injuries they've had. They've had a lot of turnover personnel-wise before the injuries, and I'm so bummed about Jason Verrett going down because he's just had such bad luck, and it was awesome seeing him being able to play most of the year last year and be healthy and coming into this year being their top starter. You don't have Richard Sherman anymore. Now Verrett's hurt. Josh Norman gets injured after you get him. So where is the secondary at going to this game? And where would your concern level be at getting ready to face DK Metcalf, Tyler Lockett, and D. Eskridge is supposed to play this week too? Yeah, you know, it's really weird because if you ask the fans, they tell you that the secondary is crappy. I actually think they're playing well. I think the bigger issue is that they've allowed a little bit more explosive plays. Like, you know, and I continue to go back to 2019 because that was the year the 49ers were relevant. They definitely weren't 2020. But – they gave up the least amount of explosive plays in the NFL, and it was not close. That was one thing that made the uh, defense so good. When you look at this 20, 2021 version, I think on a down-to-down -down basis, the secondary actually plays well, even with all the injuries. But they just they just allow these explosive plays a little too much. And that's something that's scary when you're going up against the Seattle Seahawks and they have DK Metcalf and they have Tyler Lockett, you know, these guys that are just known to stretch the field. And you have uh, Russell Wilson who throws that big moon ball down the field. Like that's something that scares me. But overall, it's really weird. Again, they've played extremely well from on a down and down basis and they and they just they smother routes. They do a good job contesting catches, but there's always that one or two big ball that they've given up in each game this year. And certainly that's something the Seahawks would be intrigued by. But I will say this from a Seahawks perspective, maybe that's a good thing for the 49ers because if they get too consumed with wanting those explosives, it does seem to curtail Seattle's offense a little bit. And we've seen that too much this year. We're going to talk more Seahawks when we come back in the third quarter. I'm going to open up the floor for Brian and Eric to ask me questions about what has been a pretty rough start, a disappointing start so far for the Seahawks. When we return, you're listening to Crossover Thursday. Bet Online is back and better than ever. All eyes are on the gridiron as teams are back for the start of another football season. And as always, Bet Online is your top spot for all the pro and college football action this season. They've got a new updated site and interface, even more odds, props, and contests. BetOnline.ag continues to be the number one source for everything football. Head to their website or use your mobile device to sign up today and receive a 100% welcome bonus. That's double your initial deposit just for signing up. And don't forget to use the promo code NFL100. From football, basketball, and boxing, right to your favorite Vegas casino games, don't wait to take advantage of all these amazing offers available for this upcoming 2021 season. Bet online, your online sportsbook experts. This episode is brought to you by Rock Auto. With the ever-increasing numbers of makes and models out there, it's impossible for your local chain stores to stock all the parts you need. So why endure the often pointless and seemingly intimidating questioning and wait while the person behind the counter orders the parts in their computer, choosing the only brand their warehouse happens to carry? You have computers with access to rockauto.com at home and in your pocket. Why choose to spend 30, 50, or even 100% more for the same parts from a chain store or car dealership? 
Rock Auto is a family business serving do-it-yourselfers for over 20 years, and they have everything you need, whether it's brake parts, tail lamps, motor oil, even new carpet. Go explore their easy-to-use website today to find the solution to all your auto part needs. Go to rockauto.com right now and see all the parts available for your car or truck, right? Locked on in. How did you hear about us, Box? So they know we sent you. Amazing selection, reliably low prices, all the parts your car will ever need. rockauto.com. Welcome back to Crossover Thursday here on the Locked On Podcast Network. I'm Corbin Smith for Locked On Seahawks, joined by Brian Peacock and Eric Crocker of Locked On 49ers. Last quarter, we looked at the 49ers on offense and defense. And now I'm going to open up the floor for you guys. I, obviously, I'm riding solo. I don't have my co-host Rob Rang here with me, but I'm going to open the floor for you guys to dish some questions out on the Seahawks. And it's been a pretty rough start. They got a good start in week one, but the last two weeks have been pretty ugly, especially on the defensive side of the football. I do want to say I've enjoyed listening to your boy Rob Rang chatting with Crocker on the new Locked On NFL Draft podcast right here on the network, too. So I want to mention that, and that is something all the, the Seahawks fans and 49ers fans alike should be checking into and uh, I don't think they're getting too much any you know um, blue and red and gold and uh, any of this kind of conversations on that podcast they're strictly straight up talking about NFL draft prospects and it's good stuff um, I, my, my thing with the Seahawks um, and Croc and I actually both were huge DK Metcalf's Metcalf fans coming into the draft I, I don't know wide well, receiver know. one for me yeah same here what he was a first rounder I, I don't know Maybe it's the neck. I have no idea. That'll be rehashed forever. Huge mistake by a bunch of teams, especially those teams at the back half of the second round. I mean, Debo and A.J. Brown, it's like, okay, I could see how that could happen. But Andy Isabella, come on, what are you doing? You know, that just makes <laughs> J.J. Arcega white side. <laughs> yeah, like it's not even close. It's it's insane. And um, but what's interesting with the Seahawks, I always feel like it's a it's either a DK game or it's a locket game. And I don't know why that is. And do you see maybe the 49ers being a DK game or a Lockett game? Yes, um, I, I can see it being either way. Here's the thing that's interesting is Lockett's had some big games in the past against the 49ers, but so is DK Metcalf. And the corner that he's had a lot of success against is Emmanuel Mosley. That first matchup these two teams played last year at Lumen Field. Metcalf torched him a couple of times and he had some success against him the year before in that season finale that the 49ers held on by about two centimeters that's how close Jacob Hollister was to having the football on the goal line there but uh yeah I, I could see either one of these guys having success but I think if I had to make a prediction just looking at past matchups and the fact that DK Metcalf he kind of was not what we have seen the first two years, the first two weeks of the season, he just he was still solid, but he wasn't that all pro receiver that we have seen. That changed last week. Seahawks obviously only scored 17 points, but Metcalf had a really big game over 100 yards for the first time this year and probably should have had more opportunities if the Seahawks would have had the ball more in the second half. So it seems like he finally got over whatever hump he was dealing with those first couple games. And I just, I like his matchup against whoever the 49ers put against him. He's motivated. He's coming off his best game of the season. And he told us today, really, he's feeling like he's just getting started. So I would have to say that Metcalf is probably the one that I think has a better chance of going off in this game. Not that I'm doubting Lockett because he's more than capable, but it seems like this is leaning towards being a Metcalf game, in my opinion. And, and correct me if I'm wrong, it seems like teams try to limit Metcalf more. Like they're more scared of Metcalf. They're like, look, we're going to we're going to put a man on him and we're going to put somebody over the top. And if Lockett beats, it, beats us, that's okay. And I, I feel like the, the Vikings last week, they got torched early by Metcalf and they said, well, we got to stop that and we got to stop that bleeding. And, and maybe that was the key to them winning that football game because they, they, they were much better against Metcalf late in the game than they were early. And I don't even know if that was necessarily the case. I mean, the Seahawks ran like negative plays in the third quarter. So and they, just, they didn't have opportunities. It felt like Metcalf could do whatever he wanted against Patrick Peterson. And maybe mm -hmm. they did start to bracket a little bit in the second half. And, and Lockett got banged up. I thought he had a severe injury early in the fourth quarter. and He came back a few possessions later. So the Seahawks, they really ended up dodging a bullet there. But um, I don't know that the Vikings, what they did defensively, had anything to do with it. Uh, 
I got to say it was the line in the second half. They went from being able to protect Russell Wilson to suddenly the Vikings pass rush. They pinned their ears back. Once it was a 10-point lead, it was game over because they could not run the ball. It felt like it was a 30-point deficit, not 10 points. And and that really allowed the Vikings to pin their ears back. And so Russell Wilson wasn't able to take some of those shots that he did early in the game. But Metcalf still had a few nice catches that second half, despite the fact that they – let the Vikings have the ball for tw- almost 23 minutes in the half. It was second straight week that it was very lopsided in time of possession in the second half. You know, I, I want to stay on the offensive side of the ball and continue to kind of talk a little bit about Russell Wilson. How has he been this year? Because last year it started off as this like let Russ cook campaign. And I mean, he looked like just a runaway MVP uh, candidate and he was going to win it. And then he kind of tapered off towards the end of the season didn't play his best ball, ultimately lost in the playoffs. How has the start of this season been in comparison to the start of last season? I think Wilson's been much closer to the first half 2020 Russell Wilson than the second half version in these games. And the thing is, I think he's made some nice throws in the second half of games, but they have scored no points in the third quarter. They've had no explosive plays in the third quarter. Fourth quarter has not been much better. They've scored two touchdowns, and they have no other points in the fourth quarter games. They have averaged under five points per game in the second half. In the first half, they're averaging over 20 points per game, which is number one in the NFL. They're number 32 in the second half. So they truly have been a Jekyll and Hyde offense. But I'm not going to put most of that blame on Russell Wilson. He has missed a few throws. There have been a few questionable decisions where he's held onto the ball too long. I feel like that's always going to be a part of Russell Wilson's game. And sometimes the Seahawks are going to be happy that he does that because of his ability to improvise and make big plays happen. And sometimes he's going to end up getting sacked and should have had a safety uh, safety at the end of the uh, game against the Titans. And the officials decided he was at the one-yard line, even though he's about 10 feet into the end zone, it looked like, when the uh, tackler got him wrapped up. But I think he's played really well for the most part, and he's got a bunch of touchdowns. He's been slinging the ball over the place. He's been making smart decisions. It feels to me like he is playing about as well as he did early last year. They just haven't, for whatever reason, they've not been able to play four quarters on offense. Either the offensive line's breaking down or they're just not getting the ball very much because the defense can't get off the field. And that's been a perfect recipe for the last two opponents. When number three is in the sideline, he's not going to hurt you. And so uh, really when he's had his opportunities, he's played pretty well. Uh, but circumstances have really impacted his second half production. How how has the transition been to the new officer coordinator uh, Shane Waldron, the guy who's kind of supposed to be bringing this McVay Shanahan type offense to the Seahawks. Does it look like maybe the players are buying in or are they kind of struggling to kind of grasp the concepts of the offense? There's been a lot to be excited about. You have seen some of those staples of Sean McVay's offense, the pre-snap motion, getting some more tight ends involved in the passing game, a more balanced approach. All those things have been crossed off in the first half, but I feel like we are seeing some growing pains. You have to remember Shane Waldron had never been an offensive coordinator beyond the high school level before this year, and it seems like there have been some issues for him with second-half adjustments. Teams have been making adjustments defensively, and I'm not sure that he's necessarily known what to do in those situations, so I think it's way too early to be concerned on that front. He's still trying to find his way. There were going to be growing pains. And unfortunately, I think the growing pains have been those really mediocre second half performances and just trying to figure out how they can get four quarters together. I'm confident that Shane Waldron's the right guy and they're going to get this figured out. But they certainly have looked like an offense especially in the second half where you do have a first-time play caller that's still trying to find his way. You have a quarterback that's trying to find his way with this offense, everybody else on the unit as well. So it's still too early to tell. I'm optimistic about what I've seen. In the second game, a lot of those things like pre-snap motion kind of went out the window for whatever reason, and it, it felt like Brian Schottenheimer was the play caller again. But overall, I've been pretty impressed with what I've seen, and the players have really bought into the offense. I know we got to get to some predictions here, but uh, we got to talk a little bit about the defensive side of the ball for the Seahawks. And, and a, a lot has been made of the cornerback position. We talked a little bit about that earlier, but to me, I feel like they're missing something on the defensive front. That was just one of the nastiest units for so long. 
And uh, am I wrong there feeling like maybe there's uh, the, the identity isn't quite there with that defensive line with just how how killer they used to be both uh, as pass rushers, run defenders. Um, obviously, there's you know so many good players inside that probably didn't get the recognition they deserved for years there. Going back to the Legion of Boom defenses, uh, talk to me about the defensive front. Has that been a letdown? And if they're not playing as well up front, obviously, and we just talked about it with the 49ers, kind of a similar thing there. There's a relationship between the defensive line and the cornerbacks, and the longer you got to cover, even if you're good at corner, uh, it's going to be more difficult if your defensive line isn't getting at opposing quarterbacks. So I went into this season thinking the defensive line was actually going to be a strength for this football team because you brought Carlos Dunlap and Benson Mayoa back. You have a healthy Daryl Taylor who has looked pretty good in these first three games for the most part. He's given them some help on their pass rush. He's improving steadily as a run defender. And, and they've had a few revelations. Robert Kimdiche uh, today, basically, Ken Norton Jr. said he's passed LJ Collier on the depth chart. So the former first-round picks kind of revitalized his career in Seattle. Puna Ford's still playing well. Al Woods has done a nice job. The problem has been consistency, and they don't have a lot of depth in that interior defensive line. Their pass rush the first game, they were all over Carson Wentz. In the last two games, the edge rushers, there's been a few drives here and there where they've really frustrated the quarterback, but it's truly been feast or famine, and there's been no consistency there. And I think that's the main reason that they have really struggled on third downs is they have not been able to generate a consistent pass rush. And then in the second half, the run defenses looked pretty good in the first half of games. They've had issues the last two weeks where – that group has really wore down. A lot of it's just been the inability to get off the field. And when you have to tackle Derrick Henry 35 times in the game, uh, bad things are going to happen in the second half. Yeah. And Alexander Madison's a pretty darn good second running back for the Vikings. You saw the same thing happen last week where first half, they held him in check for the most part in the run game. Second half, he really started to break off some big chunk plays and their run fits weren't where they needed to be. So I feel like this defensive line has underachieved a little bit, uh, but at the same time, uh, it's a group that you have seen flashes from. If they can just – this is the theme here. Can you play four quarters, which is so weird because Pete Carroll teams typically finish really well, and they have been the antithesis of Pete Carroll's philosophy in that regard this season, and that's definitely been true on defense too. I'm looking at this line and the 49ers are favored by two and a half points. And, and, and that's pretty difficult for me to choose right now. Um, but I see the over under at 52. And, and if I'm a betting man on this game, I'm going there. Uh, this is like 1917 or something like that, right? I feel like you got to go with the under of 52 points. That's the way this game feels like it's going to go. It's going to go way under. I, am I am I reading that one wrong? Um, and I guess I'll start it off because I brought it up. But um, 1917 49ers is going to be my prediction, which means that two and a half point line. I'm on the Seahawks side against the spread. Uh, but the 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 thing I'm pounding is the under in this game for 49ers Seahawks. I guess I'll go next then. So, you know, this to me is a really difficult game to gauge because if the Seahawks can play the way they have in the first half and they can do it even for three quarters, can you play three quarters worth of solid football, then I think this team can still be one of the top teams in the NFC, especially with the weaponry they have on offense. But right now, that seems like a pretty big if. They just have not been able to able to put together a complete game. You're going to be playing in a hostile environment. The 49ers do a lot of things really well that the Seahawks have struggled to be able to contain. That They've had a lot of issues with after the catch. Receivers have been running wide open. Secondary issues, especially that cornerback group. And it's put Quandre Diggs in kind of a tough spot back there. And I feel, ba feel bad for him. But... It just seems like there's enough issues right now. Seahawks fans are going to hate me for this, but I can't pick them to win this game. I think the 49ers are going to win, and I'm going the lower end of the spectrum too for scoring just because I have a feeling this is going to be a physical contest. I don't know that I'm going to go below the 52, though. I, I'm going to go 24-21, a more traditional score. Uh, so I'm going to be under that 52 mark, but – I've got the 49ers winning it by three, maybe a late field goal. I think this is going to be a, bit, a very back and forth game, but I just, I can't count on this team to get enough stops on defense. I'm worried about the 49ers being able to run the ball 
well enough, even with their running back situation right now, that they can chew some clock, get that play action game going. And as well as the offense has played in the first half, until I see four quarters of steady play, you just feel like there's going to be at least one quarter where they're not able to get anything going. And I don't think you can do that on the road against a really good football team. Man, you know, it sounds like we're talking about the same team. The 49ers haven't been able to really piece together a complete team uh, game as well. And I'm probably going to get in some trouble here with some of the 49er fans, but I'm oh. actually going to take the Seahawks. You know, I, I can't say with confidence that the 49ers are going to be able to knock off a Russell Wilson-led team. And he's been the boogeyman for the 49ers. And it's really weird the way that these games have played out. Like, most of the games that the Seahawks have won, they've won in – fashion where they kind of control the game and the way the game goes. The one time in the last few years that the 49ers have won, it was with a, you know, a goal line stand. So it's tough, man. Anytime I see Russell Wilson on the other side of, of there, I, there's just something in my heart that I can't say the 49ers will win with confidence. I can say and in, in talk about different ways that the 49ers can win if they do certain things, but Actually going out there and executing it, that's a whole different ball game, especially when Russell Wilson is there. So I'm going to go Seahawks 24-17. 49ers fans are going to hate me. I'm sorry. I apologize. <laughs> We're all going to have – well, Brian's going to be in good shape because he picked the 49ers to win. But – as for fence, Eric and baby. I, yeah, we're going to have some pitchforks and torches coming our way probably on social media for picking the other team to win. But uh, it's... I picked the Seahawks to win all three games up to this point, and I'm one and two. So I'm starting to wonder, you know, maybe I need to go the opposite direction. Maybe I can get a little bit of a jinx going here. But really looking forward to this matchup. I always am excited about these games because, as you mentioned, Brian, the stakes are just raised when the Seahawks and the 49ers play. And uh, I think it's going to be a physical black and blue matchup like it typically is that's going to go down to the wire. Absolutely. And it actually makes me a little bit worried hearing you talk about the Seahawks' fast start and not finishing, the Niners have been the opposite with not finishing fast or not starting fast. So the Niners might be in a hole again like they were last week against the the Packers, and I just don't like that game script for the 49ers. they got to be able to run the ball early and put some points up early, or it could be trouble for them. So it's going to be fun to see how things go, and I, I think maybe uh, the start of the game is going to be pretty important for these two teams. And look, the, the Seahawks back have to be against the wall here. Uh, as much and It's a home game for the Niners. They lost last week, but you can't go one to three right now in the West if you're the Seahawks. You just can't. And it could be one and four with the Rams coming on the next Thursday. I mean, it is very realistic they could be one and four. So I know Seahawks fans don't want to hear that, but. <laughs> I've seen the Seahawks start slow before and still cruise on the way to the playoffs. So if there's one team that I would not count out, you know, after starting slow, it's them because we we've seen them do this time and time again. Yeah, this is going to be a really fascinating matchup. Really looking forward to it. And uh, thanks to all of our listeners for tuning in. And hopefully all of you will enjoy the matchup. And we'll see who gets the upper hand in the first of two games between these bitter rivals.